Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another live stream of Let Us Reason. This is Al Fadi, and with me here in studio, as you can see, our dear brother Anthony Rogers. Anthony, welcome aboard and welcome back, brother. Great to be with you. Thanks. You know what? What does what does your shirt say? I mean, it's not like one of Shamon's, you know, weird uh, shirts or anything like that, right? Great to be with you. Oops, sorry about that. I had the video going. Um, I don't know if you heard that. Um, no, this is just a shirt I volunteered. I think it was last fall at an event, and they gave you a T-shirt for it. Uh, cool. It just says Fall for Greenville. That's awesome. You know, so so I have Alex uh, Blagojevich, and he was wearing a shirt that says Born Square, and somebody ordered it from our, uh, you know, uh, uh, the people who are following. So so you may make money out of your shirt. That's all I'm trying to say. So uh, uh, yeah, well, that's the least of Alex's problems. Born Square. He was also born. Uh, French. Actually, he wasn't born French, was he? He was. Uh, he moved to France, and uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. He's a he's a he's a weird guy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. One. Yeah. Well, brother. Uh, of course, uh, what a privilege to have you here. And uh, everybody uh, by now, hopefully, know who Anthony Rogers is. I mean, he has a lot of uh, presence online, whether with his own work. I mean, speaks for itself. By the way, he debates people. Uh, he has the, also a partnership with David Wood on Act 17. I am humbled and honored to have him also with us here. And if you've been following our uh, YouTube channel, Sierra International, and even uh, you know uh, Anthony Rogers, you'll see that there is a new video series that he and I have done on the Trinity in Old Testament. And we just released that. I think we're in episode two or three right now. So I thought maybe this will be a good teaser as well uh, when he's here with us today to talk about that. So Anthony, tell us a little bit, brother. I mean, you have a passion for theology and that's what I love about you. And you're an apologist, you're a debater, but the topic of uh, the divinity uh, of Christ and also uh, the topic of the Trinity in Old Testament is, is one of your amazing Amazing, uh, basically, performances and knowledge. So, why don't you share a little bit about that with us? I mean, what got you into that particular niche, for instance? Yeah. So, when I was converted, I was in a hostile context, a context hostile to the truth of the gospel and Christianity. And, you know, that was kind of surprising to me. I didn't have a lot of biblical knowledge at the time. I was just converted. I, I knew what I believed uh, and had a lot more to learn, of course. But uh, I expected that the same joy that came over me would also be true of other people. That was naive, of course, uh, but I, I just assumed, you know, the, the good news that God gave his son and the son on the basis of his finished work poured out his Holy Spirit so that we now can pray to the father through the son by the spirit. I just uh, I assumed everybody would be uh, quick and ready to receive that. You know, for me, it was uh, it was not something that I had really heard about growing up. So it was it was news. Right. And of course, good news. And so I, I just assumed that everybody would respond the way I did. And I was quickly corrected on that. And that meant, though, that I had to really study hard to know how to answer people. And it wasn't that, you know, I, I thought that my ability to answer people was going to be so great that uh, they would just, you know, uh, fall over. And, you know, at that point, I realized people have a resistance to the truth. But um, I, I, you know, I, I just wanted to be an effective evangelist. And that also, you know, ventured into apologetics. When, when people object to the evangelism you're offering, you have to engage in apologetics. And so, uh, you know, I, I also loved the God that was revealed in Scripture. And so it was a passion for me to see him in Scripture, to learn more about him and also proclaim him to others. And so over time, I, I just, uh, you know, developed more and more an understanding of what Scripture says. And one thing in particular struck me as I dealt with a lot of these groups. One of the things uh, that... I noticed uh, across the board with anti-Trinitarian groups, whether other religions like Islam or uh, post-Christian Judaism, and I emphasize post-Christian there because the Judaism after Christ is not the same thing as the Judaism before Christ, which, which actually believed the Old Testament and proclaimed the Messiah and so forth. Uh, after Christ, the, the Judaism took a different uh, turn and in reaction in a lot of ways to Christianity. But uh, I noticed among those groups, as well as in anti-Trinitarian cults, that they would often argue that the Old Testament doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity, so that if the New Testament teaches it, 
then, uh, you know, especially if you're talking to a Jew or a Muslim, uh, a Muslim will say, I mean, a, a Jew will say, well, we should reject the New Testament because this represents a departure. This isn't the God revealed in the Old Testament. And Muslims would often say, well, uh, either you're misinterpreting the New Testament or uh, the New Testament's been corrupted because it doesn't fit the Old Testament teaching about God. And so I realized this was an issue. This was an issue that had to be tackled. At the same time, I was actually, you know, pouring over the Old Testament. And I just kept seeing the Trinity all over the place. And so I'm thinking, well, what are all these people missing? How are they missing this? And then when it comes to anti-Trinitarian cults, I was uh, thinking, and this is something I thought we'd kind of start off on, but I was uh, thinking, you know, before we move back into the Old Testament, how do new uh, cults miss that the New Testament itself not only teaches the, the Trinity, but also sees it as reflective of Old Testament teaching? And, uh, you know, so that, that kind of gives you an intro and maybe we can get into that. But uh, that, that kind of explains my journey, how I got to the, the point where this was a, a, a big uh, passion of mine and also something I, you know, studied hard. And Absolutely, like brother. And I agree with you. I mean, the Old Testament, uh, I, I mean, sadly, I don't, I don't come across a lot of people that value the importance of the Old Testament in anything we believe in. Uh, you know, uh, for me to, to, uh, to say that, oh, just because I am a New Testament, uh, basically, uh, believer, uh, all I have to worry about now is just what did uh, Jesus teach me? What does the, the New Testament teach? But, you know, uh, uh, brother, correct me, of course, if I'm wrong, the New Testament uh, is, is a confirmation of everything that came before it. It's, uh, it's basically uh, revelatory, I, I love the word you use, of the Old Testament. I mean, if you can elaborate further on that. Yeah, of course, uh, many things could be said here. In the first place, the New Testament isn't intelligible without the Old Testament, right? The, in many ways, it's already assuming people have a knowledge of certain things. It talks about certain figures, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob, David, you know, and so forth. And if somebody doesn't know the Old Testament, then they're going to be at a loss when those sorts of things are mentioned. There's also, you know, terms and concepts and other things that are derived from the Old Testament that are used by people in the New Testament. But a couple of things really speak, I think, directly to this. And it's it's things like when Jesus says to the Jews in John 5, he says, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you have eternal life, but these scriptures testify about me, right? So he's saying the scriptures are about me. So he doesn't discard the Old Testament and he thinks exactly. that the Old Testament, uh, is pointing to him. But furthermore, he says in other places, uh, like Luke 16, you know, if people don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if somebody rises from the dead. In other words, no evidence, no, no matter how stupendous, uh, is going to convince or persuade somebody if they don't already have a knowledge of what the Old Testament teaches. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll write it off in one way or another. And you can see this all over the place, by the way. I'll give you an example. Muslims. Muslims uh, will resist any evidence of the resurrection as pointing to who Christ is because they're already predisposed against it. Right. Because in many ways, not just because the Quran tells them he didn't get crucified or or, or die, uh, in which case he couldn't have risen from the dead. Right. Uh, but uh, they also don't believe the Old Testament. They, they don't. Um, in a sense, they're not entering through the front door. Right. The uh, Jesus gave a parable where he said that people who try and climb in some other way, he wasn't talking about the Old Testament, but I'm co-opting it here to, to illustrate the point. Uh, he says that those who come in another way are thieves and robbers. But Paul, speaking directly to this, he says the Old Testament is like a pedagogue, which which is a, a way of referring to a tutor. Right, a tutor uh, teaches a child; he leads a child to truth. Yep. A and, schoolmaster. You know. Yeah. So Paul says the Old Testament is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. So this is God's way of leading us to Jesus. He reveals the Old Testament, and then Jesus comes and he fulfills it. He, he speaks like God speaks in the Old Testament. He does the things God does in the Old Testament. He does what God says he would do in the New Testament. And so uh, this gives you something of an idea of just how important the Old Testament is. And of course, we could talk about that for days. Amen, brother. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think I heard you say that you have a debate that is coming up soon. Yeah, on June 6th, I'm actually going to be debating a Unitarian 
on a Old Testament topic relevant to this. We're going to specifically be debating uh, the, the, the proposition is the Old Testament teaches that the angel of the Lord is Yahweh. So, uh, you know, we're not looking at the whole uh, topic of the Trinity, but certainly one crucial element of it in the Old Testament. And hopefully we'll get to some of uh, the stuff relevant to that uh, on this show. But, um, yeah, yes, we're going to discuss that topic. And part of the reason for debating Unitarians, number one, of course, I want all people to know the true God, not just Muslims. But but because I focus on Muslims, a lot of people wonder why I do so much uh, with Unitarians. One is, is of course, because I, I'm not just concerned about seeing Muslims come to Christ, uh, but also because Muslims use Unitarian material, Unitarian arguments. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone. I'm able to address a Unitarian error that claims to be Christian, while at the same time refuting arguments that are used by Muslims who don't claim to be Christian. So uh, right. I think of it as very so, so brother, I, I, I like it to be in a systematic way. So first, first of all, let's talk about the Trinity as a doctrine as found in the Old Testament. Um, you want to share an example or two, for instance, for the benefit of those who are with us. I mean, uh, you know, Isaiah 48, uh, for instance, is one of those, uh, uh, you know, chapters that come to mind. Uh, there is other passages in Old Testament, but I'll leave it up to you if you want to specifically mention one of those to give people a, an idea uh, why we did a show, uh, a video series on this. In fact, uh, I just want to encourage everybody to go to uh, CIRA International and watch that video series that we did. We called it the Old Testament, uh, I mean, Trinity in Old Testament. Brother, where can they find it? I know you've been posting it too. Where can they find it at your end also? Is it your Facebook page or do you have a YouTube channel? I have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's just Anthony Rogers. Uh, okay. You know, I haven't been posting there for, for years, but I started to post some videos. But mostly I post videos on David Wood's channel, Act 17 Apologetics. But I, I did start posting some things on my channel. Um, so uh, they can expect to see stuff from me on both in, in both places. So, yeah, both. Excellent. So, so that's why, I mean, I wanted Anthony today to give be a teaser of some of the stuff we covered. Obviously, the video series is long one, you know, and you'll get the benefit of massive amount of scripture. And I have to say, we did not do that series it's justice because Anthony could have kept on going. I mean, we have so much that we still have not covered. So br brother, uh, go ahead, you know, share what you feel like, uh, you know, will be appropriate. Okay. So one way I like to start off this topic with people is just pointing out, uh, uh, first of all, a passage that uh, is suggestive. I, I think there's more to it, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, initially it's puzzling to certain people, certainly to anybody who doesn't believe in the Trinity, uh, but it at least gets our, our uh, you know, whets our appetite and, and gets us thinking. And it's a well-known text, uh, but in Genesis 126, the very first chapter of the Bible, we're talking about God creating all things. Genesis 126 says, let us make man in our image. So in the, in the English text, God uses two plural pronouns. In Hebrew, there it's a, a verb and a noun. The let us make is a verb. It's, it's a, all three words, let us make, come from that, that singular, uh, that one verb. But what's interesting is the embedded subject of the verb is plural. So, so God literally says, let us make. Now, that term already indicates that whatever us refers to there has to be involved in the work of creation. And so uh, this is already, you know, an interesting uh, statement. But it also goes on to say uh, in our image there, it's a noun. But again, the embedded subject is plural. So who is God speaking to when he says, let us make? Who does he include in the work of creation? And who does he say uh, is included in this image, this common image that man is made in, right? Now, uh, some people try to write this off in ways that are just uh, altogether unacceptable. Uh, some people will try to write this off as just a, uh, an idiom uh, known as the plural of majesty. Now, part of the problem here is that any Hebrew scholar can tell you there's no such thing as a plural of majesty with respect to verbs in Hebrew. Uh, that just doesn't occur. It's not a feature of the Hebrew language. 
Now, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, that the, the plural uh, majesty couldn't be used of other uh, terms or what have you. But when it comes to verbs, it just doesn't exist. But as I mentioned, let us make is a verb in Hebrew. So that interpretation doesn't work. And there are other reasons it doesn't work. For example, in Genesis 3.22, God does it again. Uh, and he says, uh, after man fell, he says, behold, the man has now become like one of us. Notice it doesn't just say he became like us, but he says one of us. That's part of it. It indicates more than one. That's not a plural of majesty, even if you think a plural of majesty uh, exists in Hebrew. So, uh, you know, the problems could go on and on here. So, so what is going on? Well, other people have tried to say this is a reference to angels, right? God is speaking to his. Yeah, husband. I heard that before. Exactly. Yeah. But remember, God says, let us make man in our image. So if he's talking to the angels, whoever holds this view is attributing to angels uh, the work of creation. They're co-creators with God. So, uh, uh, you know, now we need to talk about what's ironic here is a lot of people falsely accuse Trinitarians of being polytheists, right? We believe there's only one God, but he's multi-personal. But now those who say that this actually involves the angels as co-creators are by necessary implication uh, 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 deifying angels. Right? You can call them angels all day long. But if you're attributing to them the work of creation, then you are, in fact, uh, saying of angels that they are, uh, are deities. They perform a divine work. That's also true if you say man was made in their image, right? Because in the Old Testament, first of all, it always says we were made in God's image. It never says in the image of angels. It doesn't even say angels were made in God's image, by the way. But, but notice that often when Scripture uh, requires our obedience— uh, it, it does so in terms of our being image bearers. In other words, uh, uh, Scripture tells us that we are to obey God. We are to, uh, we're, we're, we're image bearers. We are to reflect him. So Scripture will say things like, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. In other words, our uh, because we're made in his image, we owe him our obedience and worship. But if we were made in the image of angels, then it also implies or entails that we should be rendering our worship and service to them, right? We should be reflecting them True. as opposed to God. So there's just a lot of problems with the whole idea that he's talking to angels. And, and here's an, another issue, and this kind of starts getting uh, us into the proper understanding. Angels are not mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis. Now, my point here isn't that angels didn't exist at, by day six when God's creating Adam. Uh, but my point is that contextually, they're just not there. So so uh, a person would have to read that into the text. And that's not usually the best route to take, right, when you interpret something. But what does Genesis 1 say? Genesis 1 tells us that God created all things by his word and spirit. Right. Uh, and this is echoed later in Scripture. Uh, Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all their starry hosts by the spirit that proceeds from his mouth. Uh, but already in, in Genesis one, you know, it, uh, in verse one, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says the spirit of God was brooding over or hovering over the surface of the waters. So God and his spirit are already present. Uh, in the first and second verse of, of Genesis, right? And the spirit, the way it describes the spirit there is uh, it, it's like a eagle hovering over its nest and brooding over its young, protecting them. And so the, the idea is that the spirit is upholding and maintaining the creation. And so he's already then being implicated in a divine work. And then immediately after that, it mentions God creating things by his word. And uh, I won't go down the whole uh, line here, but uh, just to put it out there for people, when you read through the Old Testament about God's word, it's not always portrayed as a uh, merely as an utterance, uh, or we might say more fully and uh, exactly that back of that spoken word, Scripture presents God's living or personal word, right? Uh, for example, in Genesis 3, after man falls, it says that Adam and Eve heard the voice of God walking in the garden, right? That's a curious expression. And people, exactly. 
they, they misread it, really. What they think it's saying is they heard God's voice, but that's not what it says. It says they, uh, you know, they heard the, uh, in the sense of words, but it says the, uh, the voice of God walking in the garden. That's what they heard, the, the, the walking. So right? the, the, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to bring this up. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. So if you look at and, and this isn't just a Christian idea, by the way. If you look at the, the Jewish Targums, they'll say it was the word, the Memra in Aramaic, or Logos in Greek, which is the term the Apostle John uses for Jesus when he says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and then goes on to say, by him all things were made. And right? the pronoun here is reference to the word. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, here you have John completely in line with earlier Jewish interpretation, completely in line with the first chapter of Genesis, saying that God's word is a person and was with God and created all things. So that is the contextual understanding of, Ge uh, of Genesis 1.26. It's also uh, you know, confirmed over and over again in the Old Testament, which attributes creation to the spirit. Uh, if you look at Job 33, for example, uh, or Psalm 104, verse 30, it attributes creation to the spirit. Uh, and so on and on. I mean, this is a consistent biblical teaching. So uh, for people to say it's not in the Old Testament or for them to say it's not what Jews believed when really it is what Jews believed, though not later Jews, but earlier Jews, or for people to say the New Testament writers innovated this or for people to say it's not even in the New Testament, but isn't introduced until the fourth century and at some council. You know, all that's wrong. All that's wrong. It's right there in the Bible, the first chapter, in fact. So, Great. And, uh, you know, again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is another live stream of Let Us Reason. Uh, this is Al-Fadi, and with me here, our dear brother, Anthony Rogers. And we are talking about the topic of the Trinity in Old Testament. And uh, obviously, it was intentional because we just released a new video series that I did with Anthony uh, at our studios. And it was concerning the topic of the Trinity in Old Testament. And Anthony, in my view, is an authority when it comes to that topic. And he's doing a debate uh, also concerning the angel of the Lord being uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. And we are going to address this as well. And I want to just thank all of our moderators. Thank everybody who is following us here. Thank you for those who are giving through the super chat. Uh, we appreciate your sacrifices here. And um, also, I want to give a big shout, of course, to all of you uh, for promoting really what we're doing. But uh, here is two teasers for you. Sunday, I'm going to have a believer from Saudi who is going to join me here. And uh, at 6 p.m. New York Times, 11 p.m. London time, we'll be sharing his journey to Christ. And we'll talk about how the Lord is using him in the kingdom, but also the kingdom of God. But also on Monday, we're going to do a special edition uh, since many of you probably have heard about the terror atta attack or attempt that took place at Corpus Christi in Texas, we are going to have a two hour, a two hour, uh, basically discussion on the doctrine of jihad and will be with me a special guest whose specialty also in that area. So hopefully everybody going to join us again. I want to emphasize the following me and Anthony or me or any of my guests, we do not attack Muslims. We're not here to antagonize Muslims. We're here to reveal the truth. And in this case, it's really Islam as a byproduct. Uh, it's attack when it comes to the Trinity. It's a byproduct of the idea that they believe the Jews don't have anything in their doc uh, in their uh, scripture that substantiate what we believe in. And with that says, I'm going to turn it back to you, brother. Somebody's asking a, an excellent question uh, or making a comment. It's right here. Veronica is saying, I agree with Anthony, but it could be that the angels are addressed as witnesses the creation of man, as such are taken into the process, although not creating. Now, uh, Anthony, I would agree that this could apply to Job, as in Job we read about this. But in reference to let us make man in our image and our likeness, would you like to elaborate on this? Yeah, so you mentioned Job, and I assume you're referring to, for example, Job 38, where it talks about the sons of God shouting for joy when God created, right? Exactly, uh, not, exactly. Not, so there were witnesses there clearly, you know? Right, now, now first of all, uh, let me just make sure people aren't mistaken about this point. When the first verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the angels aren't there at that point. 
right? They come into being at some point uh, when God initiates the work of creation. But a, a person can say, you know, the angels were present when God created man, right? They, they existed at least. And I already addressed that, right? I agree that the angels existed, but I don't think that you can read that into Genesis. Number one, because the verb uh, says, let us make, so it's a cohortative. It's 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 basically uh, an exhortation. Let's do this, right? So yeah, if you wish, if you wish, let's do this, right? You know, yeah. I mean, it's so, almost uh, yeah. yeah. So it's it 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 implicates whoever's being addressed in the work itself. Now, contextually, as I said, you already have a very uh, clear uh, list of candidates for who God could be talking to: His Word and His Spirit, and this is consistent with the Old Testament. The Old Testament explicitly says that the angel, I mean, excuse me, that uh, the spirit created man, right? Uh, I gave a couple of passages. Psalm 104, 30 talks about God, uh, you know, it says you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. Job 33, exactly. Job said, the spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So there's no reason to... Um, you know, import angels into a text where they're not mentioned uh, in order to account for something which the context already accounts for, which is explicitly stated elsewhere, right? So, uh, and then and then if you, you believe the New Testament, this becomes even clearer. Uh, if you ask in terms of the New Testament, whose image was man made in? Well, what's interesting is you have the, the image of God in man being related to all three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Nobody would question that we're made in the image of the Father. Well, in the New Testament, remember, it's it's addressing the fact that man, though made in God's image, fell. So the image becomes distorted, if you will. And so man needs to be renewed back into the divine image. But what does the New Testament say? Whose image are we being renewed into, conformed to? Over and over again, it tells us we're being conformed to the image of Christ, right? Roman, Romans 8, uh, Ephesians 4, Colossians 4, it's the image of Christ. It also says... Uh, you know, that we're being transformed into the image of the spirit. Uh, so, so again, I mean, this is just a consistent thing. Uh, Old to New Testament, uh, you know, angels aren't there contextually, can't do what what uh, is being said there uh, and don't need to be inserted there because the Old Testament, New Testament definitively identify who created man, right? Uh, Father, Son, and Spirit created man. So. Yeah, and, and and I would argue also, uh, and, and and brother, uh, feel free to uh, you know chime in here. In in First Timothy three sixteen, uh, there is an interesting uh, reference in there as the fact that when Jesus uh, entered into our creation, our time, it says that that has not been seen by angels. So, uh, in other words, if angels were participating in creation, for instance, of the body of a man or a human being. Why would it say that they haven't seen what they have created, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I um, I guess we'd have to look at that text for for me to. Well, I'm saying, I mean, uh, just in a generic fa uh, in a generic way. Uh, yeah, I I'm mean, not trying says, to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Here, here I'm thinking of. Uh, I mean, it says he was manifested in the flesh, seen by angels. Uh, so yeah, it does say he was. It indicates that he wasn't seen. It indicates he wasn't seen before that. Now he's seen. Technically, they're talking about God is being seen now, uh, you know, uh, by the angels, because obviously you can argue that from Isaiah 6, it says that their eyes were closed also, two wings, their eyes were closed, as if it's indicating that really no one can technically speak and look straight at God, especially when angels are in his presence, and the, yet they're still unable to see his glory. Yeah, I mean, definitely God's glory uh, is is too brilliant for anyone to directly and persistently gaze upon it. Um, but anyway, I didn't mean to derail the, the yeah, conversation, no. brother. I was just thinking uh, through uh, that uh, kind of argument that angels could be participating in creation, which is, to be honest with you, I mean, it's a little bit troubling to me when you think like someone else co-partnered with God in yeah. creation. I yeah. mean, as if God needed the help of angels. Yeah, it plays right into the hand of Muslims in a sense because... You know, they they um, well, not only are they looking for an excuse not to believe in the Trinity, but also to accuse Christians of being uh, polytheists. Right. Uh, so if we were actually committed to this idea that angels were co-creators with God, then they would have the justification they need to call us uh, 
polytheists and say we're guilty of shirk. But there's an irony here, though, uh, when you look further into the Islamic sources, because the Islamic sources actually do say the angels uh, helped Allah in creating. And, and, and part of that is because, so I mentioned that if you, if you look in the ancient Jewish sources, when they interpret Genesis 1.26, they say that it was the word of the Lord who created man in the image of the Lord. Right. So it implicates uh, the, the word God's logos here with God as creating things. Well, the Jews didn't like that. And so later came up with the idea that he was talking to angels. So Muslims are actually following a later Jewish idea, which was a reaction against uh, not only early. I mean, the Christian view, but also earlier Judaism. And that position is actually more polytheistic than uh, anything. So uh, it's actually quite, kind of ironic when you think about it. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, the Islamic sources actually say that the angels fashioned Adam's body. Uh, you know, the, uh, one angel went and got dirt from one area and another angel got dirt from another area and, and so on and so forth. And they all came together and, you know, molded a man. Um, Amen. Amen. So. Again, thank you so much, everybody, for watching, uh, you know, this live stream with our dear brother, Anthony Rogers, and the topic of our discussion has to do with the Trinity in Old Testament. Do you have another maybe example or two before we venture into also the angel of the Lord? Um, yeah, so uh, we looked at the first thing we looked at in, well, uh, actually, let's, uh, let's look at Genesis 1924. This is a... a Great texts. We're still in Genesis, by the way. I, I like uh, I'm pulling it up here real quick, but um, I, I like pointing out that, I mean, here we're really, we're kind of skipping across things. There's so many things in between Genesis 1 and Genesis 19, but uh, it's interesting to observe that this sort of thing happens over and over and over again in the very first book of the Bible. Right before you even get to uh, later books, you, you've already got this rich display of God's triune character. But th this passage in Genesis 19, first let me set up the context. In Genesis 18, before before you come to chapter 19, God appeared to Abraham with two angels, and it initially just says that three men appeared, and right. first have a further identification of them. Uh, but three men appear, Abraham rushes to uh, greet them and attend to their needs. He's showing all the house hospitality of a Middle Eastern man, right? He, uh, he rushes to attend to them, feed them, address uh, any of their needs. And then it quickly becomes apparent that one of those men is actually the Lord. It literally calls him Yahweh. And so uh, as Abraham discovers who this is, they, they have a conversation. And at first, the conversation centers on uh, the promise that that time next year, God's going to return to him and he's going to have a son. Because all, all that time up to Genesis 18, Abraham has desired an heir rather than, uh, you know, just somebody uh, in, uh, in his house that uh, would get all of his stuff like Eliezer. And, and then he had uh, a child with Hagar, who was a slave woman. Uh, you know, and so that didn't fulfill it. So uh, God appears to Abraham and he tells him, you're going to have a son. Well, after that, we're told that the other two men leave and go down to Sodom and the Lord stays behind and continues talking to Abraham before he departs and goes to Sodom because he says uh, he's going to go down to Sodom and judge it for the outcry that has come up to heaven because the, the Sodomites were wicked, right? They were engaging in wicked acts and so god has come now to to bring judgment upon them so so the lord remains behind with abraham and he says shall i hide from abraham what i'm about to do it's rhetorical he's saying no abraham is the man that i have chosen uh, through whom to bring uh the the messiah into the world is is the overall idea and he says, I'm not going to hide anything from Abraham of this great weight, right? Uh, this nation is right next door to him. And, you know, so he's going to inform Abraham what he's about to do before he goes down to Sodom. Remember that because it becomes very relevant. So he stays behind. He tells Abraham that. And then we're told that the Lord departed from Abraham. So remember, God has appeared on earth in the form of a man with two others that appear in the form of men. 
when you get to the next chapter, you find out that those other two are angels, right? They, they, they go and they rescue Lot and his family and take them out of Sodom. Well, uh, in, in chapter 18, then the Lord finishes and then he departs and goes into Sodom. But notice what it says uh, in Genesis 19.24 when God brings judgment. In Genesis 19.24, it says, then, uh, then the it's Lord... very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Then the Lord, and the, and the Hebrew word here is Yahweh, the divine name. Then the Lord, Yahweh, rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord, Lord Yahweh in heaven. out of heaven. Yeah. Exactly. So... Here you have, and there's there's no question grammatically, by the way. I mean, I could have just looked at this text, but I wanted people to see the context uh, because what you've got contextually is one person's on earth, and it says he rains fire from the Lord from heaven. So you, you have this juxtaposition between one person called Lord, another person called Lord, one of whom is raining fire from the other. Uh, but just grammatically, you've already you've already got a clear indication of two persons called Yahweh. Uh, the, the preposition there from the Lord and not to get too technical with people. But in the in the Hebrew, there's actually before the second occurrence of Lord, it uses the direct object marker. And what it's it, what it indicates is that there's a subject, the Lord, who's raining fire from another who's the object of the sentence. He's the one doing uh, the action. So uh, there's no question grammatically or contextually that this is properly understood as more than one person. And both are called Yahweh. And once again, just to, uh, you know, uh, make a, a continuation of the earlier observation, uh, when you look at the Jewish Targums, it says, the word of the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. So they call that first person called Yahweh the word right? exactly the which is the appropriate way to think about it to be honest with you that's uh, in my view it's a christophany yeah yeah and, and so it, uh it, it's an indication that they understood god's word to be more than just a bare utterance uh actually refers to a person someone who is with god and properly can be called god he's actually called by the covenant name of god and, and by the way this is not as well known uh, but it's been a view of Christians throughout the ages and the view of ancient Jews, even the Talmudic Jews, the later Talmudic Jews couldn't shake this, but all, all across the ages, uh, believers in the Bible have believed that God's name, Yahweh, is what's called an incommunicable name. Okay, What that means is, uh, if you think of the word God, for example, uh, sometimes people will will try to obfuscate when when it calls Jesus God and you know somewhere and they'll say oh well um, you know Moses was called a God to Pharaoh right or, or something like that of right. course that in isn't mean, uh -huh. yeah he's not really being called God what it's saying is in Pharaoh's eyes you know you're going to look like God is the is the idea it's so it's not really calling him God but 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 my point is that there you have a use of the term God in something other than it's uh, you know it's not literally calling uh, Moses God, but it is using that name in some way you know in reference to him. But the Jews didn't believe, neither did Christians uh, ever, that the name Yahweh could ever be used for anyone, right? Even figuratively or any you know in any other way. That is a distinctive covenant name. It addresses God alone, could never be applied to creatures, not even in some kind of, you know, representative fashion or anything else. So, so here you just have a really powerful indication. Again, first book of the Bible of more than one divine person. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Sam Shimon sends his regards to both of us. You can have it hey, right hey. here, you know, see. He says, <laughs> I'll go live after these heretics. So notice Sam follows heretics. Uh, hey, uh, folks, uh, you, you want to follow Sam, please, because he pays attention to how many people are watching right now, the views, you know. So please go and watch him after we finish, since yes. we're heretics, you know. He's, he's the authority of uh, sound theology. Yes, but notice, but notice, he says he follows heretics, right? So we follow Christ, right? Now, but my point is, he's admitting that the people he follows are heretics. I'm just... Uh, being facetious, yeah, of course. 
We, we love you, brother. Uh, Sam uh, did mention that he's going to go live right after this. Uh, please, guys, uh, make sure you follow him as well and support our dear brother. And pl please, brother, tell us how can people support your ministry, by the way? I mean, I don't want to be remiss here uh, not to mention that. Yeah, I have a, a Patreon account. I don't remember the link for it or anything. I always forget. That's to... not a good start. You know, you're just going to yeah. say I have. <laughs> yeah. So you can look for it if you're interested. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of things and it's, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to being able to do a lot more, but I, I'm, I'm usually really active. Uh, as you know, uh, my, uh, vocation, I have three jobs, you know, for, for a number of reasons. Um, you know, one is my youngest daughter uh, got ill a few years ago. And, um, so just to support our family, I'm the only one who works. I, uh, have three jobs. But I uh, I had graduated from seminary last year and was ordained and appointed the regional director in South Carolina for prison ministries. But in order to do that job uh, and, and get rid of the other two, I have to uh, get support for that from churches in South Carolina. So I go to different churches and I tell them this is what I'm because normally if you're a pastor, you you're serving a particular congregation and they're the ones who meet your financial needs, right? But I don't have a particular congregation. I'm serving prisoners and prisoners obviously aren't, uh, you know, supporting me. So I have to go to different churches to raise the support. Well, COVID-19 slowed all of that down. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of behind a bit on that. But once I get to full uh, support for, for that uh, job, I'll get rid of the other two and uh, then I'll also have more time to engage in apologetic stuff. But even having said that, with those three jobs, I still do a lot of apologetic activity. I produce videos with David Wood. I appear on live streams with you. I appear with Hatun Tash of DCCI Ministries. You know, anywhere uh, somebody asks me to go, I go. Uh, I do the debates. Uh, you know, so uh, none of that is to suggest I'm not really, really active. So, uh, yeah, right. if somebody wants to go to the program. Yeah, please, guys, uh, make sure uh, you be praying for our dear brother and supporting him also and uh, physically as well. Uh, so are you saying, brother, as an apologist, you're not making all these millions that Muslims uh, think that you are making, you know? No, you're no. Not, you know? And, I, and, okay. I, and they can't accuse me of not having a job. I have three. So <laughs> I hear you. Well, brother, why don't you jump into the angel of the Lord uh, concept? Okay. Yeah. So the first recorded mention of the angel of the Lord occurs in Genesis 16. With Hagar, so, exactly. Yeah, with, with Hagar. Now, um, actually, so let me pull this up here. But uh, it's Genesis 16, starting in verse 7. And uh, you know, a number of things to be said here. I, I mentioned this is the first recorded mention of the angel of the Lord. And by that, I mean in the Hebrew text, which is of course the authoritative, the inspired text. But uh, if it, because what I'm gonna show indicates that the angel of the Lord is God, if you look in the Jewish Targums again, uh, you'll see that they actually use the, the name angel of the Lord in other places earlier in Genesis, just as an alternative way of referring to God uh, on, on certain occasions. Um, but but anyways, uh, looking at uh, Genesis 16, uh, starting in verse 7, and let me just change my uh, translation here because I uh, uh, was doing something else and I much prefer this one. Um, in Genesis 16, 7, it says, Now the angel of the Lord found her, meaning Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. Now here, let me pause for a moment because a lot of people will already uh, start off on a wrong footing, right? They're already going to uh, be thinking here uh, uh, the wrong idea and, and just aren't going to be able to make uh, uh, good progress because of it. Uh, a lot of people assume that the word angel means a created heavenly being, right? But that's not what it means according to the Bible. Uh, in the Bible, the word melach, that's the Hebrew word, melach. Messenger. Just, you know. a messenger, yeah. somebody who's conveying a message. So all it's telling you is the function that this person is carrying out. He's doing something. He's bearing a message. It doesn't tell you anything about who that messenger is, 
or what kind of being that messenger is. And that's why, for example, the word is actually used more often in the Old Testament for human beings than anyone else, right? Because human beings are usually the ones in view in scripture. Uh, and, you know, they're often carrying out this messenger activity. Uh, and so you could have, you know, a, a, a king, for example, could send a servant <clears throat> to uh, carry a message or he could send his very own son. Right now, obviously, in terms of status and everything else, a son is much greater than a servant. Right. So but but you wouldn't know any difference between them just from the term messenger. Uh, you don't you know, that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, so. It's a mistake to think that the term indicates necessarily some kind of being. It doesn't. You have to determine from the context who's in view. Moreover, the term is also used for God. Let me give you an example of that. In uh, Malachi 3.1, by the way, the, the, the name of the prophet is Malachi. It's Malachi, Malachi, yeah, Malachi yeah. right? So Malachi, it's, it's yeah. uh, uh, Malach, angel, with the uh, personal suffix. So uh, it means my angel, my messenger. So the human prophet right. is called my messenger, right? But this is uh, this is great. In chapter three, he refers to the Lord Ha Adon as the messenger of the covenant, the Melach Haberit, right? So there, the Lord is called the messenger of the covenant. So it's a term that can be used for men as well as for God, not just for created heavenly uh, beings. And so when we see the angel of the Lord appearing to Hagar, we can't assume, oh, this, this just means a creature from God that has wings or something along those lines. Scripture doesn't uh, teach that. This passage doesn't say that. But notice how it goes on. In verse 8, it says, he said, that is the angel of the Lord, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, uh, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. And then he goes on to, to say some additional words. But notice he speaks in the first person here, making a divine promise, a promise that only God could make in truth and, and actually pu fulfill uh, right. when the time comes, right? Only God, in fact, this is the same promise God makes to Abraham, right? I will multiply your descendants and, and you know there'll be too many to count. So this already indicates that this is no ordinary angel, right? But notice how the verse, uh, the, the section ends. Uh, after the angel of the Lord finishes speaking in verse 11 and verse 12, this is what it says in verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord, Yahweh, the name of the Lord, Yahweh, who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Exactly. Now, yeah. Notice notice a couple of things here. I actually, you know, years ago, I, I uh, had this Jewish friend. Uh, we, we've lost contact uh, for the past several years. But uh, one of the things he said to me was, well, Hagar was overwhelmed by this experience. And so she called the angel God, but he really wasn't. Right now, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, what One problem is that. Uh, you know, in the first place, the text doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say that she mistakenly called him God. Second, uh, if this was the case and she did this, then the angel would have been obligated to correct her, right? We see evidence of that elsewhere in scripture. Uh, in the book of Revelation, for example, John bows down to worship an angel uh, because he's overwhelmed by the visionary experience. Uh, and then the angel says, don't do that. I'm just a servant like you are, right? Don't worship me. Uh, but then thirdly, notice it's not just Hagar who calls him God. It's Moses, right? Look at verse 13 carefully again. In verse 13, Moses says, then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. And then he quotes Hagar. You are a God who sees. So right. Moses says it was Yahweh that spoke to her. And Hagar says he was God. So here you have a very clear indication that the angel of the Lord, and notice it's a it's not just angel here, it's the angel of the Lord. That expression throughout the Old Testament is the specific title 
of this divine person. It's used repeatedly of a divine appearance, and we would argue ultimately for a theophany. And what is so interesting about this, by the way, and in the, in the context of Islam, of course, you know that Abraham and Hagar are a big deal, and they are basically considered to be the progenitors, of course, of Ishmael, that many Muslims think that the Arabs came through the descendant uh, descendancy, I should say, or genealogy uh, connection, if, if you wish, with Ishmael. Now, here's what's so interesting about this, that Yahweh would speak to Hagar, but he will not speak to his seal of the prophets and his final messenger, supposedly. Yeah. Isn't that amazing, by yeah. the way? It's it's a good observation, yeah. And there's also, yeah. of course, um, there's also, of course, the uh, fact that, you know, the text doesn't speak in a flattering way about Ishmael, does it? Uh, yeah, uh, especially here, of course, when you get to verses 11 and 12, you know, he will be a wild donkey of a man and his hand will be against, you know, his brothers and their hands will be against him. So um, all that to say, brother, uh, maybe one more example of that and then tell us one more uh, time about this debate and how can people may basically either watch it live or where can they go and watch it after its uh, conclusion? Um, yeah, OK, so let's uh, go to Exodus 24. Four. Uh, I'm going to start in Exodus 24. Huh? Exodus 24. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to start here and then move backwards, and, and you'll get an idea for why that is. But uh, in, in the context, remember the, the chapters are uh, they're, they're, when Moses wrote the Torah, the first five books, uh, including Exodus here, he didn't use chapter numbers, right? He just wrote. Genesis, he wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Later, for convenience, for ease of reference, we added chapters and uh, verse numbers just so we can locate things. So this is part of an earlier context. And in the context, it's God who's speaking. Okay, But notice what God says in 24.1. He's talking to Moses. He says, it says, then he said to Moses, remember, God is speaking. He said to Moses, come up to the Lord. You and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. So what it's describing is Moses coming up, uh, going up the mountain to Yahweh. Uh, the nation can't go up the mountain. Uh, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu are able to go up uh, some distance, but they can't go near like Moses. So they're further than Israel, but not as close as Moses. But did you notice something interesting? In Exodus 24, 1 and in verse 2, even though it's God who's speaking, he says to Moses, come up to Yahweh. Why does God speak here about Yahweh to whom Moses is to go in the third person? Right. Why, why does he speak as though Yahweh were another? And here, actually, this is uh, interesting. In the Talmud, the, the later Jewish uh, teachings found in the Talmud, they actually stumble over this. And, and they say, why does he say, come up to Yahweh instead of saying, come up to me? Right. So they recognize that there's an issue here. Uh, they don't try and uh, come up with makeshift arguments that people have later come up with, like God is just talking about himself in the third person. Uh, that's not their their way of going about this. That uh, you know, that's a later attempt to deal with this sort of thing, um, and and part of the reason for that is actually explained by the prior context. So so moving back in Exodus twenty three, you actually have a contextual explanation for why God speaks this way. Look at what it says in Exodus twenty three verse twenty. Okay, in Exodus twenty three verse twenty, the Lord is speaking. And he says, behold, I am going to send an angel, Melach, before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. And then Amen. the text Amen. goes on. So, so notice several things here. First of all, uh, in verse 23, uh, uh, it says, and I, I didn't read this part, but he says, my angel will go before you. Um, 
uh, and bring you into the land. And then, uh, oh, actually, verse 21 says, be on your guard before him. What it literally says here is be on guard from his face, right? They're being warned about this particular angel that's going to go before them. And they're specifically told to beware of his face. One of the interesting things throughout the Old Testament is how often people are afraid when they uh, when they encounter God. And, uh, uh, you know, they're afraid that having seen God, they're going to die. Right. And we know, of course, that there's uh, there's some sense in which they don't see God in all his fullness, even in these theophanies. Right. God is appearing in a visible way. Uh, but he's necessarily condescending to the limited capacity of man. But even then, these people are gripped with fear uh, that uh, just beholding even this limited form of revelation, uh, they're going to be destroyed. Well, here God is telling them he's going to go before you. His face will go before you. Beware of him. Right. And, and the reason they're to be aware of him uh, is uh, and, and obey his voice and not rebel against him is because this one has the power to withhold forgiveness, right? Somehow he is sovereign over whether or not these people will be forgiven. Something you would assume is only true of God. In fact, this exact phrase, lo uh, yasala uh, pishachem in Hebrew, is only used one other time, and it's used for Yahweh. In Joshua 24, 19, uh, it says, he is a holy God, he will not pardon your transgression, lo yasa la So it's it's clearly a, an indication of the prerogatives of deity. But that's made very explicit when it says the reason why this is all true of him, that you're to be on guard before him, obey his voice, don't be rebellious uh, before him, he won't pardon your transgression. All of that is true because my name is in him. Okay, notice this is this is critical. The ordinary idiom for delegated authority, when, when it talks about you know somebody representing God and speaking for God and, and so forth, is uh, to say the person speaks in the name of God, right, in his authority. But that's not what it says here. It doesn't say it this. Because his name is in him, in his right? person. And that expression, uh, first of all, a lot of people don't really pay careful attention to how the name is used throughout the Old Testament. Often the name of God stands for God himself. It, it represents his nature, his character, his presence. His and, person, uh, his authority, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So as an example, uh, you know, the psalmist will say things like the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Now, it's not literally saying this word is a strong tower. It's saying God is a strong tower. Right. It's referring to God. So the name stands for God himself. But even more helpful are all those passages uh, in the Old Testament where God speaks of his uh, name dwelling. He says, I'll make my name dwell in the temple, right, when, when it's constructed. Look, for example, at Deuteronomy 12. Over and over again, God says there that his name is going to dwell in the temple. And what he's saying is he is going to dwell in the temple. He is going to be present in the temple. So the right. idea is the name stands for God himself. It represents his very presence. And so, let me add just one more point to support what you're saying. If people would like to go, for instance, to John 17, 26, when the Lord is praying to the Father, mm -hmm. and in the NIV versus the King James, for instance, in King James, he says, I made your name known to them. The NIV says, I made you known to them. That's right there is an indication that the name represents the person of God himself. So just to support what you're saying, brother. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. I mean, I think, I, I think people kind of instinctively, you know, that they just don't stop and reflect on it, right? Like if you read a passage that says, sing praises to his name, right? You don't literally think you're singing praises to the word Yahweh. You think you're pra singing praises to him, right? The one the name uh, belongs to, right? So when Exodus 23 says, my name is in him, it's identifying the angel as the one who bears the very name, the identity, the nature, the character, the prerogatives of God. He is the presence of God. In fact, that's why Isaiah 63 actually calls him the angel of his presence, the angel of his face, panim, the same word that's used in Exodus 23. So in some specific way, this angel bears God's name, his nature, his character. That's why Exodus 24 says, come up the mountain to Yahweh. God, Yahweh, is talking about 
Yahweh, namely the angel of his presence. So if people would closely read their Bibles, they would see this sort of thing. It's all over the place. We're only scratching the surface. Amen, brother. And I just want to support what you're just saying also. And uh, Sam did an excellent and amazing teaching on this many times. In fact, just recently, a couple of days ago, I caught him in a, in a lecture about this. Uh, you mentioned Exodus 20. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, Exodus 23 verses 20 to 25, I would say, you know, then you jump to Exodus 24. But then if you were to go to Judges chapter 2 verses 1 to 5, you'll see that the same angel that was mentioned already in Exodus 23 verse 20 said that he's the one who swore a covenant to their forefathers. That's why he's known as the angel of the covenant. And that ties into what you mentioned also about uh, Malachi 3.1 that uh, the Lord whom you are waiting will suddenly enter into his temple, even the angel of the covenant, which by the way, you can make a case now that that's Jesus himself, because we're talking about John the Baptist who came to pave the way for the Lord, who is known also here as the angel of the covenant. So you can see how we can make a case that Jesus himself appeared in Old Testament, and he's the one who was leading uh, this Exodus uh, endeavor, basically. Uh, any final words, brother? Uh, and you want to talk a little bit about your uh, debate, your uh, uh, upcoming debate? You said June 6th. Uh, how can people watch it? Can they watch it live? Yeah, so it will be live, Lord willing, on Act 17 Apologetics YouTube page. So I think many of the people that are, are here and know you also would know David. Uh, he's been on your show many times, of course. I know nothing about David, you know, yeah. so. <laughs> Even though he's a bigger heretic than Sam Shamoon. But um, yeah, so uh, it'll be on Act 17 Apologetics YouTube page at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So okay. Lord willing, uh, everything uh, in his providence works out. We will be debating that. I'll be debating a Unitarian. His name is L.J. Threepland. Uh, he... Um, he sort of initiated it in a sense, which I thought uh, was interesting. I mean, I know I did say uh, I did say let's debate this, but you know he he was sort of goading me, asking me questions, and uh, you know, so I, I expect a, a good rousing debate. We'll see uh, how well that goes. I mean, I've been trying to get other Unitarians to debate. Uh, Sam can testify. Uh, the Unitarians are, are in many ways running scared. Some of their top guys, they won't debate Sam. They won't debate me. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, a good thing in a sense, you know, we like to get the truth out there and debate is one way to do that, but it's, it's good in a sense because it shows that, uh, even they are having pangs of conscience. They, they've lost confidence. They've lost their nerve. And yeah. I know some of them won't like me saying this very generally, I'm not saying every single Unitarian this is true of, but if, if there's the, you know, there are Unitarians out there that want to debate, they should be approaching us. I'm ready to debate any one of them my, myself. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Is he the same one that you refuted one of his arguments about the fact that when Thomas says, my Lord, my God, it was Anderson Yahweh by agency through Jesus Christ himself. And I think you wrote in a blog, was that in Acts 17, by the way, or, uh, you know, uh, um, answering Muslims.com where you have it? Oh yeah, so I write. I've written for like ten years on answering Muslims uh, blog, but we we haven't written there much in in the past several years because we've done more YouTube videos. But I, I recently a Unitarian who's kind of part of that general group. It's not the guy I'm going to be debating, uh, but this guy is actually kind of well known by people if they've studied any Unitarian uh, people. Uh, his name is Kermit Zarley. He also right. goes by the name of Servetus the Evangelical. That's um, right. Yeah. Not an evangelical. If you reject the Trinity, you're not an evangelical. But uh, um, yeah, he tried to argue that uh, that when Jesus, when Thomas called Jesus my Lord and my God, he wasn't really calling Jesus God. He was just recognizing God uh, that Jesus represented, right? And so, I mean, that's just a terrible argument. Um, and so I, I refuted that on the blog. Yeah, and it was amazing, of course, and uh, thank you for doing that, brother. And uh, it's, it's, it's again, it's unfortunate, obviously. Uh, some people, when they're fixated on their own uh, warped ideology, 
and theology in this case. They want to just come up with any excuses as to why they can find things to support it. But obviously, our Bible is read in context. You know, I love the, the way you answered it uh, by using examples like, well, how come you ignored when Jesus says, I and the Father are one, for instance? You know, why, why is that, for instance, uh, not a big deal for you? You know, so uh, it's, it's the same spirit that is behind all of these heresies, obviously. And we want people to be encouraged to know that the word of God, as our brother Anthony mentioned here, if you read it, and if you pay attention to it, and if you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal things to you, you're going to see amazing things in the Word of God. I mean, and not that I, I'm saying we mastered it. We still learn every day. But uh, we need to really approach the Scripture knowing uh, with confidence that it has the truth. Uh, the Word of God said it is described that your Word is truth. It's the source of all truth. Well, brother, thank you, of course, for making time for us. And hopefully... A uh, couple of weeks from now, we would like to see you again, and uh, maybe we'll wait until after the debate, and uh, maybe you can share with us about some of the things that were discussed in that particular debate. Once again, by the way, some of the moderators, amazing moderators that we have, found your Patreon link, and they posted it right here. If you need it, you need to pay us to give it back to you, okay? So uh, we posted it here for people. Uh, we encourage people to please go there and uh, find ways to give to our dear brother. Okay. Thank you, brother. Any last uh, words you want to share? No, uh, it's been great being here with you all. I hope it blessed everyone. And I look forward to being back with you, Al, uh, anytime you want. Thanks, my brother. It's an honor to have you, of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to those who, uh, by the way, uh, gave through the super chat. We love you. And uh, reminder again, on Sunday, which is the day after tomorrow at 6 p.m., at 6 p.m., New York time, Eastern time, which is 11 p.m. London time, UK time. We're going to have a special guest, another Saudi believer that will join me here. And Lord willing, it's going to be about an hour and a half. On Monday, we'll have also another, another uh, basically special edition that has to do with the doctrine of Islamic Jihad. And we'll talk about that. I have a guest that will join me whose passion and specialty is in things like this. I don't want to spill uh, the beans yet. Uh, we will announce more details about what will be shared during that. But it will be most likely at 5 p.m., 5 p.m. New York time. But I will announce it. Uh, we may even make it 4 p.m. New York times because we want the maximum number of people to be able to watch that particular special edition. Thank you again, brother. We love you in the Lord, and uh, we will be praying for you on June 6th. All right? All God right. bless everyone. Take care.